Hi everyone, my name is Fatima and today I'm going to be talking about AI, art, and really ugly renaissance portraits. And by AI, I mean artificial intelligence, of course. A little bit of housekeeping before I start my talk in earnest. This talk was pre-recorded, which means that I'm actually sitting here in the conference live, just like the rest of you, and I'm not distracted by giving a talk, so if you want to ask questions during the talk, I can actually answer them in the Discord real time, so that's pretty cool. It also means that if there are any mistakes in the talk, I had every opportunity in the world to fix it and chose not to. The last thing is that my slides are up on my website, fbox.ca slash letsketch20. You can see the URL at the top right of every slide. And uh, the slides have not that many images, but all of the images that are there have alt text on them. And as I'm going through the presentation, I'll do my best to describe the images on every slide. Uh, but they should also work with screen readers if you want to go through and do that. So a little bit about me. Like I mentioned, my name is Fatima. I'm a production engineer at Facebook in Seattle, which is sort of like site reliability engineering and software engineering. Um, that's probably one of my other interests, so you can always talk to me about that if you'd rather ask about that than AI and art. I almost completed a fine arts minor at a school that values art not at all. Our art building was an extremely tiny, kind of decrepit building, and they kept building like bigger and bigger engineering buildings around it that were like these huge glass monoliths. So we get no sun now because there's all of these buildings in the way. And I did not finish my minor because there were two art history courses that I did not want to take because I thought they were boring. I did a fourth year project, uh, importantly not a thesis, I was not allowed to call it a thesis because my grades were not good enough for me to qualify for writing a thesis, on generative art. Uh, generative art is basically any art that was in part made through some sort of autonomous system. So in this case, any art made with a machine learning algorithm would be considered generative art. And uh, besides that, I still make art sometimes. Primarily, I really enjoy painting and sewing. I also sometimes draw little comics, and obviously I did a little bit of dabbling in art made with machine learning algorithms. Uh, to the right is a little image of myself, clearly not a picture of what I look like in real life, but it is what I would look like if I was an anime girl, and this is actually generated using a little cool little tool called Selfie to Waifu that you can look up and use. Um, and that tool is based off of some of the algorithms that we're going to talk about today, so that's pretty cool. So the machine learning algorithms that this talk is primarily going to be focused on are called generative adversarial networks. And these algorithms have become pretty popular amongst a subset of artists nowadays. Um, and I'm gonna refer to them mostly as GANs. And what they do is really in their name. They're generative, which means they create something, most often images. They're adversarial, which we'll get into in the next slide, but it kind of means that there's two algorithms inside them and they fight. And their networks, they're made of up of neural networks, they're machine learning algorithms. So on this slide, I'm going to try to give an overview, like a high level overview of how GANs work. Uh, don't worry if you lose me, it's not the best explanation and it's also not too important to understand for the rest of the talk. But basically, inside of every GAN, there are two machine learning algorithms. One of them is called a generator, and one of them is called a discriminator. With generators, discriminators, and basically all artificial intelligences, what's really important to have is a data set. You want to have a huge data set of images, text, whatever, that you want to train the algorithm on. And you know, this is called the training set. So in the scenario that we're going to talk about today, we're going to assume that we have a data set and that data set is comprised of thousands and thousands of full frontal images of human faces. And we're going to say that our goal here is to create a convincing image of a person, like, you know, sort of out of thin air, that's not based on any actual person, that looks very convincing, like it could belong to that original data set that we trained our algorithm on. So like I mentioned, in a GAN, there's two main components to it. There's the generator and the discriminator. And they both have separate jobs that, you know, they do exactly what they sound like they do. So what a generator does is that it 
creates images that it thinks look like the images that it was trained on. So in this example, we're going to train our generator on thousands of images of human faces, and eventually it's going to get really good at creating images of human faces. The discriminator, on the other hand, is going to be trained on the same data set, but instead of learning how to create an image of a human face, it's going to learn how to distinguish an image of a human face. So given any image, it's supposed to determine, is this an image of a human person or is this not an image of a human person? So we get these two neural networks and we sort of put them against each other. We get them to fight. And that's the adversarial part of generative adversarial networks. So what I tried to describe with this little diagram here is that, you know, the generator will generate an image that it thinks belongs to a data set. For example, this not very convincing smiley face. The discriminator will say something like, this is bad. This does not look like a person from the data set that I was trained on. Uh, try again. And basically, this happens millions of times until the output of your GAN is something that is relatively convincing to have belonged to that original data set. And both of these algorithms, they get better and better by training off of each other. So the input into the discriminator is actually, you know, images created by the generator, and the generator takes into account what the discriminator says about these images to get better and better at its job. So they work together to be an even better machine learning algorithm. So like I mentioned on the slide before, a really important part of all machine learning algorithms, and GANs are no exception, are the data set. The images or whatever that you want to train your machine learning algorithm from. So there is this data set of Renaissance portraits that a, a few artists in this field thought were very interesting and could be used to, you know, train a GAN and see what we get out of the GAN. And the reason that people sort of hooked on to Renaissance portraits is that uh, there's a lot of them. A lot of people made portraits during Renaissance times, and we have them documented. We have them in museums, and museums take pictures of the art that they have, and they upload those pictures to the internet. So it's like a very easy source of something that generally in the world people widely consider to be art. So it could be very interesting to put this into a machine learning algorithm like a GAN and see what the GAN can learn from these portraits. So the image on this slide is just a Renaissance portrait uh, of Marie Antoinette, actually, and it was painted by a female portraitist, which is not super common for the Renaissance period, uh, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. And I really like this painting. In my fourth year of university, I did a separate project on it, not related to GANs, so I just thought I would include it. And if you're interested in female portraitists, uh, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun was very interesting, and she made a lot of sort of controversial paintings. Uh, so one example of someone who used this data set of Renaissance portraits to create a GAN that outputs like Renaissance portrait fakes is Robbie Barrett. And you can go to his GitHub. All of his stuff is like totally available on GitHub. You can fork the repo and everything. And he did a relatively good job of creating these kinds of portraits. So... On the topic of these Renaissance portraits, we come to a sort of controversial thing that happened at the end of 2018, which was three French students created a GAN-generated portrait, and they called it the Portrait of Edmund Bellamy. And it's pictured on this slide to the right. You can see it. It's nice in this gilded frame. And these students sold this painting at Christie's, Christie's Auction House for $432,000, which is not a lot of money for Christie's auction house, but objectively is a lot of money. And Christie's is like sort of the higher institution of art. There's two of them, there's Christie's and Sotheby's. And you know, like they're British, they're it's like the kind of place where you would sell a Van Gogh or a Jan Van Eyck. So like getting a piece of work to auction at Christie's is a really big deal in the art world. And when this sale happened, um, a lot of articles came out about it. Christie's even made their own announcement. And they sort of skewed the way of saying things like, the first artificial intelligence created piece of art. Like, the like this piece of art was made by an algorithm. Algorithms are getting so smart. Like, they can paint now. 
robots are taking over the world. The future of art is algorithms. Uh, now me and all of you just learned about how GANs work, and you basically know that there's just normal machine learning algorithms that train on really huge data sets of images and then try to make copies of those images. They're not, you know, robots. They don't have humanity. They're not that intelligent. They just see images and they copy them. So a lot of the language used around this auction was a little bit grating for people who had been working in this space for a long time. And something else is that the image itself was not really considered to be that well generated. Uh, you can see there's a lot of texture printed on the version that they created. And the reason that that happens is those are something called like GAN artifacts. So if you think about Renaissance portraits, there's strokes of paint painted over canvases that have texture. So what happened here, it kind of looked like, is that their GAN sort of hyper-focused on that texture and then tried to copy it over, and it came out a lot more pronounced than you would expect it to from an actual portrait. Um, and besides that, there are just better examples of people who used very similar data sets and very similar algorithms to create much better results, but those people didn't sell their images at Christie's Auction House for $432,000, you know? And like I mentioned before, um, Robbie Barrett is one of these people, and Obvious seem to have made liberal use of their of Robbie Barrett software. Um, they actually like forked the repo, and that's what they base their work on. Uh, if you look really close at this image, in the bottom right, you can see like what looks like a little equation. <laughs> they signed their portrait with a like statistical model equation instead of their names because they really wanted to push the point like oh. Oh, like math made this image, not us. <sighs> uh, so obviously when this happened, it raised a lot of very interesting questions for the art community to contend with. Like who deserves credit for the Edmund Bellamy portrait? Can an algorithm really be an artist? How do we ascribe value to art? Why was this particular piece of art worth $432,000? And why was that banana taped to a wall worth $10,000? Who does and does not have power in this situation? Who is making the decisions for who gets the credit and how much it's worth? How do we reconcile free and open source software values when the world of software and high art collide? In general, it's pretty much allowed for you to fork someone's repository and make your own content with it. But in this case, they made a ton of money from it at an auction house. And, you know, just a bunch of other questions that we're not going to answer. Um, obviously, these are very interesting questions, and I personally did think about them a lot when I was working on my fourth year project and when I was still in university, but they're not that relevant to this talk, and honestly, they're just not that fun. But I do recommend that you think really hard about them because that's good. So what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk is CycleGAN, which is a particular kind of generative adversarial network, and the art that's being created with it out in the world right now. So first we're going to do a little bit of an overview of what CycleGAN is and how it works. So it is a generative adversarial network like we mentioned before, and I did the whole explanation of them. Um, but in its case, it's actually two generative adversarial networks. CycleGAN trains two generators and two discriminators, and it does what we call unpaired image-to-image -image style translation, which is a lot of words to say that it takes images from one style and converts them to another style. So for example, and the example in the image on the slide is zebra to horse. CycleGAN can take an image of a zebra and make it look like a horse, or it can take an image of a horse and make it look like a zebra. And it works in both directions because it has two generators and two discriminators. Um, for our purposes, the thing that's most interesting about CycleGAN, as well as its sister algorithm, which is called Pixapix, is that it works surprisingly well even on relatively small data sets. Like I mentioned, the thing about machine learning algorithms that is the most important is the data set. 
And for the most part, you need on the order of thousands of images to train a GAN to get good at anything, and most machine learning algorithms. But CycleGAN is able to get relatively interesting results with you know, an amount of images on the order of a few hundred instead of a few thousand. And that's the link to the paper for CycleGAN if you're interested in learning more about it and the actual nitty gritty of the statistical models and stuff that they use. So we're going to talk about some art that is made using CycleGAN. And the first artist we're going to talk about is someone called Helena Sarin, whose art I really, really personally admire. And she was a big inspiration for the project that I ended up working on. She does this style called neural bricolage. And if you don't know what bricolage is, it's kind of like collage, uh, where you take bits and pieces of other images to create a new image. But it's a little bit messier and more multimedia than collage would be. And what Helena Sarin does is she makes digital bricolage out of images that she generates using GANs. So she uses very small, very curated data sets to train CycleGAN and its sister algorithm, fix to fix And these data sets are made entirely of photographs that she took herself. And the curation that she does with the data set really affects what kind of images she gets out of the GAN. So for her, it's really like quality over quantity, whereas for the majority of the algorithms we've talked up until now about, it's more about quantity over quality. If you feed it enough images of Renaissance portraits, eventually it will create something that looks like a Renaissance portrait. And she's also actually published a very useful guide for anyone who's interested in learning more about using an algorithm like CycleGAN or fix to fix to create art, and I've linked to it here. Uh, and this is one of her images. She calls it Am I Dolly Yet? Which is kind of a cheeky name. And it's really interesting to me. So it's made up of images that she created with a cycle GAN and she's, you know, mashed them up, cut and paste, put them together. And now it kind of looks like a very abstract flower vase and it's pretty and it's nice to look at and it's got a lot of interesting textures in it. And she was a big inspiration for me when I was working on my project, which we'll get to in a bit. Another really interesting project that's a lot more recent than the ones that I've talked about so far is You Get It, which is the algorithm that was used to generate the selfie to waifu project. It came out in the last couple of months, whereas um, a lot of the other stuff I was talking about is from around the time of 2018 and 2019. And the You Get It will turn you into an anime girl. So the slide, or the first slide, which had an image of me as an anime girl was generated using this algorithm. Similar to CycleGAN, you get it is trained in both directions so it can take images of anime girls and turn them into people and it can take images of people and turn them into anime girls so if you look at uh, these two images it actually does a really really good job of taking people and turning them into anime girls and what's like really shocking about how good of a job it does is that it really captures like anime eyes which is hard to do because anime eyes look nothing like real people's eyes. They're like huge, they're a weird shape, they've got like interesting coloring all the time, they're placed differently on the face than you'd expect them to be. So training a machine learning algorithm to be able to like convincingly make these kinds of eyes when the source image is a, you know, a proportional human face is pretty cool. And the reason that it's able to do this is that it uses fun and new technologies, like for example, class activation mapping. Um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about because I don't really understand it, but you can always click on this paper and learn more about it. But class activation mapping sort of allows the algorithms to learn what the most important features of a style translation are. So in the case of anime girls, the most important feature that you want the algorithm to get really good at doing is the eyes and the mouth. Because the eyes and the mouth of an anime girl are the most different from the actual image of the person. So the algorithm needs to get really, really good at that particular translation in order to make a very convincing fake. Uh, so as you can see, you get it does a much better job of geometric changes than previously like cycle GAN that I talked about before could do. And that's kind of a really big deal about GANs, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to my project. And if you want to learn more about them, that's the link to their paper. It's pretty interesting. If you have a good background in machine learning, you will probably understand a lot more of it than I did. 
So finally, we're going to talk about my project, uh, which was called Flower to Textile. It was my fourth year project in university. And what I wanted to do with it was be able to take pictures of flowers that I took out in the world and convert them to the style of a floral textile. But like I mentioned before, cycle GAN and most GANs don't do a very good job of doing large geometric changes to images that they're trying to do style translation on. Um, and this, I, I knew this when I was doing the research for my project. It was something that was made very clear by the other artists that were working in the space. Um, but I figured that I would do something a lot like Helena Sarin's work, which was using the output of the GANs and doing a little bit of collage and like my own post-processing to create something that looks like something I actually wanted, which was floral textiles. I ended up having to do a lot more post-processing than I wanted because my GAN did not even do a very good job of taking single images of flowers and making them look floral textile-y. So if you think about the main features of a floral textile, it's that it's two-dimensional, um, there's a lot of depth in the flower, so there's very stark contrast between the darks and the lights of the flower itself. And also, obviously, there's a repeating pattern, which I knew the GAN would not be able to do. And even just trying to get it to look more like a textile, like flat, two-dimensional, uh, has stark contrast, was a struggle for the models that I trained. So this image to the right shows you uh, four different models that I trained during the course of my project and also the original image. So the original image is that pink flower at the top and then what it looked like after I ran it through my four models, those are all of the outputs. And as you can see, there was a lot of stuff that went weird. Like sometimes there would be these big black splotches in the flower and I wasn't sure why. Um, sometimes, for example, in model four, nothing would change. And um, I decided that model two was my best bet because it does look a little bit two dimensional. It sort of blurs out the background. Um, and there's a pretty stark contrast between the center of the flower, which is one color and the outside, which is primarily another color. And basically the difference between all of these models I trained was that I changed some of the settings and hyperparameters of the algorithm before I trained it. But to actually turn any of these images into what you would expect a floral textile would look like, I did a great deal of post-processing in the GNU image manipulation program. Uh, and that was a lot of work for me. I did a lot of cutting and pasting and creating repeating textiles. And I'll show you some examples on the next slide. But I did still get an A on my fourth year project. My professors were very understanding and accommodating and chill. And I had a very good time working on the project. So. These are some other images that basically this is after the output of the GAN was like a single flower. I would cut the outline of the flower and then I would combine it with some of the other output of the GAN and make it into these interesting patterns and then I would create a repeating textile out of them. And these are just two of my favorites. And actually, the background of all of the slides up until now, the sort of red bunchy flower with the green vines, is something that was created for my fourth year project. It's one of my patterns that I made and I really like it. It's my favorite one, so I used it for all the slides. And these two are also kind of nice. I think the blue one is probably my second favorite. I think it turned out really good. Something that I've been thinking about a lot since mm, like two weeks ago when <laughs> I read the selfie to waifu paper is that if I try it again and I use their algorithm, I might get more interesting results since it does a much better job of geometric translation than like CycleGAN could do. But I haven't made any progress on that because it's hard to have a GPU to do machine learning on. If you like my art and think that it's cool, you can buy it. Uh, I have a website hosted on like Society6, which is basically this website that will take like artists upload their art and then Society6 creates a line of products for them. So if you like wanted my art on a t-shirt or a throw pillow or a print, as you can see on the right, you could buy it from Society6 and I would get like $2 from every sale. And I donate all of that money to Real Rent Seattle or similar organizations. I also accept commissions. So if you have a picture of a flower that you would like me to turn into the style of a floral textile, I can also do that for you. And if you're interested in any of those things, you can contact me on fbox.ca.
And uh, that's all for me. I hope you felt like you learned a little bit about generative adversarial networks and the way that they're being used to make art. Thanks to all of these lovely people, Denise, you and the Let's Sketch team, of course, for putting together this great conference. Uh, Helen SRN, she let me use her art on my slides, which is very nice of her. My mom for giving birth to me. She doesn't actually know I'm giving this talk, so she'll never see this, but it's always good to thank your mom. Uh, my friend Daniel, because he said he would do post-processing on this video. My profs from Waterloo, who helped me with my fourth year project and were very, very patient with my not-so-great results. And also all of you for coming to the conference and paying for the tickets and listening to me talk about something that I'm interested in. If you want to access the slides, they're at fbox.ca slash letssketch20, and that's all. <laughs>